The following recording is fully owned and or licensed to Christians for Biblical Equality International. No reproduction shall be made without prior written consent from CBE. Originally, when I was asked to speak, the, the topic of the conference was be transformed by the renewing of your minds from Romans 12.2. So I started working on Romans 12.2 in the context and I got all excited because it goes on to talk about one body and many gifts and I was going to tie those together and actually I was going to title the message One Body and Many Gifts. And then what I found out was they stole it <laughs> for the whole conference. And, and I had one great idea and now what am I going to do? And so I was kind of nervous but I was thinking it's all right because you know, I'm the first speaker. Everybody's flights will be delayed and everything. But <laughs> you all are very punctual. But this passage teaches us about new minds and a new body, which sounds great to me because I'm over 40 now, but it's talking about Christ's body. We yield our bodies as living sacrifices in verse 1, and the ultimate purpose is to serve Christ's body in verses 4 and following. Let's look first... Oh, did I tell you what book we're in? Sorry, Romans chapter 12. Romans chapter 12, starting with verse 1. We learn, first of all, that our bodies are living sacrifices. Phoebe Palmer, who was a very well-known minister about 150 years ago, talked about laying all on the altar. That was one of her favorite phrases. And this text especially deals with laying all on the altar. We're living sacrifices, giving everything to God, being totally sold out to him. Paul wasn't the only person in the ancient world to speak of spiritual sacrifices or a spiritual temple or things like that. Some ancient thinkers talked about how the gods didn't need temples and they didn't need sacrifices. But Paul takes it in a special direction because here all of us are called as believers to offer spiritual sacrifices. Back then, priests were the people who offered sacrifices. Here, we are the priests, but we're also the sacrifices. It's ourselves that we offer. And in verse 1, he describes the sacrifice with three adjectives. The first adjective is living. A living sacrifice is an oxymoron. You all know what an oxymoron is. Uh, sometimes people have been waiting a long time for a letter and, and they speak of postal service as an oxymoron. <laughs> or some people think, d depending on their political views, some people think of military intelligence as an oxymoron. Um, I, I can't comment on those, but I know one thing that people often speak of an, is an oxymoron, is not an oxymoron, absent-minded professor. We professors are absolutely not absent-minded. Uh, I forgot, what was I talking about? Uh, anyway, living sacrifice. Sacrifices are by definition supposed to be dead, but in our whole lives, we're continually yielding ourselves up to God and to God's purposes for our lives. Gives another adjective describing this sacrifice in verse, in verse 1. The sacrifice is supposed to be living, holy, and acceptable. The Old Testament often spoke about holy offerings, offerings that were holy to the Lord. What that means is completely devoted to the Lord. One definition that I think in some ways describes holiness better than anything else is loving God so much that nothing else matters by comparison with God. We're so set apart to God, so devoted to God, that nothing can compare with Him. Sometimes we think that we can do things in our own power, by our own strength. Sometimes some people may think that the egalitarian movement, you know, the culture is going a certain way and that'll be enough to make it. But that's not true. Especially for evangelical egalitarians, the culture is not going our way. But God's Spirit is what makes the difference. I'm really grateful that some years ago Mimi was organizing prayer meetings for biblical equality because it's only God's Spirit. It's when God pours out His Spirit on His sons and daughters that He raises up the gifts in the body of Christ. The sacrifice is to be living, holy, and He goes on to say acceptable or pleasing to God. Often in the Old Testament we read about acceptable sacrifices. And when that term is used, often what it means is 
it talks about a sacrifice that's acceptable to God because it's offered with a pure heart. Paul speaks of his own ministry later in this letter as, as a sacrifice acceptable to God. He speaks of the contributions of the saints in his letter to the Philippians as a, as a sacrifice acceptable to God. A sacrifice that's acceptable to God is a sacrifice that we offer with all of our heart, trusting that the Lord will be pleased with it. But he says something else about this sacrifice in verse 1. He tells us that the sacrifice is living, holy, and acceptable. And then he says, it's your rational service of worship. Some of your translations may say your spiritual service of worship. The King James actually got this one right. The, the reasonable service, it says, the, the Greek word there is a word that means rational. It has to do with your minds. It's the renewed mind that he's about to describe in more detail in verse 2 that teaches us how we can use our bodies in ways that are living, holy, and acceptable to the Lord. We have to have a new mind. And by the time Paul's hearers in Rome would get to chapter 12, they already have some idea where he's going with this because back in chapter 8, he contrasted two kinds of mind. He spoke of the mind of the flesh versus the mind of the spirit. That is, a selfish mind, which he says can't please God, it can't be acceptable to God, as opposed to the mind of the Spirit, with God's own word written inside of us. The mind of the Spirit means that we think Christ's way. We let the same mind be in us which was in Christ, a mind of service, a mind of caring for others. We think the Spirit's way. The Spirit gives us a new way to think. Verse 2 develops what this means tells us about the renewed minds, how renewed minds think. Now again, there were many other people who said something similar to what Paul says here, although um, they left out the most important part about Christ. But many ancient philosophers spoke about having a heavenly perspective, having a mind set on heavenly things, by which they meant not being self-centered, but being truth-centered, being able to, to have a cosmic perspective on what's right and what's wrong. For us, being truth-centered means especially being Christ-centered. As Paul says in another place, that we are to set our mind on things above, where Christ sits at the right hand of God. When he tells us what the renewed mind is supposed to think like, he says, don't be conformed to this world, but rather be transformed by the renewing of your mind. The renewed mind doesn't think the way the world thinks. The world thinks in self-centered ways how to serve ourselves. The kingdom way is to think about everything for God's will, God's purposes, building up Christ's body to reach the world, being sold out to God so that we can do everything for God's purposes. Sometimes that's difficult for many Christians in North America. Many Christians in North America spend more time in television and entertainment and immersing ourselves with the values of the world than we actually spend immersing ourselves in God's Word. And then it's not surprising that statistics show that we often end up acting just the way the world does. Often, too, we're tempted to depend on the same things the world around us does. In North American Christianity, it's very common to depend on technology, money, sometimes political power to achieve our ends. Now, keep in mind I'm not against technology or money or political power. I, I, uh, I'm using technology right now, and if any of you has any money you want to give me, I, I won't complain. But the context here tells us what we really need to depend on. It comes by God's gifts. It comes by depending on God's grace. It's what God does through us that makes a difference, and not our own strength or our own abilities. Not being conformed to the world means not being pressed into the world's mold. The world seeks to define us in their categories. The world seeks to define who we are. And we have to be defined instead by who we are in Christ. In the egalitarian movement, we get uh, egalitarian evangelical movement, we get critics from the right and the left, and probably the front and the back too. I guess we won't get any from the back today, but um, we get critics all around. But not being like the world, being like Christ, means that we don't respond in kind. I have a temptation where I tend to worry too much what other people think of me. But we need to let God set the agendas. 
let God define who we are and what our mission is. Mariah Woodworth Eder, uh, a major evangelist in the late 19th and early 20th century, and Amy Semple McPherson, a megachurch pastor in the 1920s to the 1940s, and many other people have discovered this principle that when negative publicity is the only free publicity you, you can get and you can't afford to pay for any, it can be useful. But we need to not depend on the world's values. We need to not depend on the world's ways of acting. We need to think like Christ thought. We need to follow the example that he gives us. And he goes on to talk about how we can know God's will. He gives three adjectives that define God's will. The renewed mind helps us to recognize what God's will is. As a young Christian, I was really mystical, trying to, trying to find God's will, trying to be led by the Spirit, and I still believe in that. But over time, I learned that there are also other ways that the Lord leads us. Sometimes the Lord leads us by showing us what's right, and this passage gives us some indications of, of what's right, what God's will is, with three adjectives describing the will of God so that your renewed mind can recognize it. First of all, the will of God is that which is good. Paul has already used this phrase over ten times in his letter to the Romans. So his will being good uh, is a moral criterion. Whatever is morally good is his will. Secondly, whatever is acceptable or pleasing, it's the same word that he used in verse 1. We want to be an acceptable sacrifice to the Lord. We want to be pleasing to the Lord. Then we also need to discern what is acceptable in his sight. If it's something that we know will please him, that's his will. And third, perfect. Ancient thinkers used these three criteria, as well as others, as ethical criteria to try to discern what was best to do. Paul uses them as, as one tool for discerning God's will for how we can serve God fruitfully, to show us how we can use our body in God's service, as he mentioned in verse 1. But how does the renewed mind think? Is Paul just going to speak in generalities? In verse 3, he gives us a concrete expression of how the renewed mind thinks. The renewed mind thinks, in verse 3, by considering how each of us can serve God's purposes, not thinking of ourselves more highly than we ought to, not thinking too little of ourselves either. David served God's purposes in his generation, it says in Acts 13.36, and then he fell asleep. We shouldn't think too highly of ourselves because the kingdom doesn't rise or fall on any one of us. We have our place, we fulfill our purpose, and God raises up others to carry on his work. A few weeks ago, I was feeling overwhelmed with work, and I talked with my, my pastor, because I knew he had a whole lot more work than I do with 6,000 members in the congregation. And he told me a little secret that I needed to just slow down and rest, or otherwise they would be doing one of their Thursday morning services for us. That's when we most often conduct funerals. <clears throat> and that uh, Palmer Seminary would then hire another New Testament professor who writes books, and life would go on. So I tried to rest uh, a few more minutes that week. We shouldn't think of ourselves too highly. We also shouldn't think of ourselves too little, because one person with a vision can be a catalyst for her generation. Think of the Apostle Paul. Think of the difference that Paul made in the world in his generation. Think of Paul's stand against, against requiring circumcision for Gentiles. Now, there were probably other people who shared Paul's views, but it was Paul who was able to make the intellectual arguments and carry the weight in his generation. And I, for one, am very grateful that he won the argument. For some of you women, that may not be as meaningful, but for most of us here who are men, very glad that Paul won that argument. But also, there are many examples through church history. St. Francis and St. Clair of Assisi made a difference in their generation. Adoniram Judson and his, uh, his three wives, uh, he didn't have them all at once. These were uh, high mortality on the mission field. Hudson and Maria Taylor, William and Catherine Booth, the founders of the Salvation Army, and so on. You think of Hannah, who was praying for a son, 
She wasn't praying for revival in Israel. She probably didn't even know that the high priest Eli was almost deaf to God's voice. She was just praying for his son. But her prayer from a pure heart changed the course of her nation's history because God answered by giving her a son and sending revival to that nation. How many of us will pray to God from pure hearts and stand in the gap to make a difference in our generation? Verse 3 is telling us that we need to recognize the gifts that God has given us so that we can seek the gifts that will meet the needs of our generation. Some gifts God has already put in us, um, but also he goes on to speak of, of the needs of the body of Christ. And so sometimes you can seek for gifts that will meet those needs. When you see the needs, God, please, somebody needs to do this. And quite often when you pray that, you'll, you'll find out that God will use you with the gift. Uh, I, was, I was having that experience years ago when I was praying for, for God to lay on some people's hearts to, uh, to write this particular book. And I was very busy doing other things. And then the Lord laid it on my heart to, to, uh, to write that book. And I had to go do a bunch of extra research. And was almost sorry I prayed it at the beginning. But in the end, I was, I was grateful. Uh, it's those who prayed for labors for the harvest in the Gospels that saw God raise up labors for the harvest. Verses 4 through 6, our bodies can serve his body. Again, Paul wasn't the only person, certainly wasn't the first person, to speak of one body with many members. Many philosophers of his day, they spoke of the universe as a body, uh, and they spoke of, of everything in the universe as members. More importantly, they spoke of, of a community of people, the state as a body, and all the people in it were many members. But Paul applies it to a living organism of a group of people who are committed to God's will and God, God working and speaking through us as a body with many members. The first person that we know of to use this example of one body with many members was Meninius Agrippa. And Meninius Agrippa didn't use it at all the way Paul did. Um, the plebeians, they were the poorer people of Rome. They were complaining that the richer people of Rome, the patricians, were, were taking all the resources and consuming all the resources while the plebeians did all the work. So Meninius Agrippa came along and he said, you know, you shouldn't feel badly because it's just like a stomach. You know, we're one body with many members and the stomach doesn't look like it's doing all the work, but you need the stomach to consume the food. Well, that's what we patricians do. You know, you plebeians do the work, and we consume the food. And the way the story goes, they bought it. I, I, I don't know uh, why, that, why that would have worked. But in any case, Paul uses it in a very different way. He adapts it so that we are one body with many members, but each of us is special. Each of us has a gift. Each of us has a purpose. I remember one time I was in worship at a, at a place where the worship was just so exuberant and lively, and my worship style was a little bit different than the worship style there. And I was, I was feeling like, God, my, I'm not very good at this. And I suddenly felt the Spirit speak to me that I was created unique and special and that I was the only one who could give God the glory that, Craig, that God created Craig Keener to give him. And each one of us, we may feel weak in our most honest moments. We may know what we're made out of, that we're just made out of dust and ashes. But everybody in the Bible was made out of just dust and ashes too. God used them, and God will use us, not because we're made out of something so special, but God will use us because it pleases him to use us. Because each of us is special in his sight. Each of us is gifted in his sight. And, and each of us offers him the worship that he desires. I'm going to uh, tell a story about bringing different gifts later on at the end. But first I want to look at examples of the gifts in verses 6 through 8. Paul gives a different list of gifts in 1 Corinthians 12 gives a different list and kind of a different context in Ephesians 4. But in all these 
passages where he gives examples of spiritual gifts. In each case, the emphasis is on God's grace. It's a gift that comes from God. It's not something that we did. It's not something that we earned. Neither is it something that we ought to resist when God has given it to us. Nor is it something we ought to be squelching in other people when God has given it to us, which is part of the, the point of CBE. Some of the gifts that he lists, in verse 6, he mentions the gift of prophecy. Now this is the most common ministry role in the Bible. It's not the most commonly mentioned in the New Testament, but you take the whole Bible together. It's the most commonly mentioned ministry of the word role in the Bible. Paul ranks it second only to apostleship in 1 Corinthians 12, 28. Was this gift distributed on the basis of gender? 1 Corinthians chapter 11, Paul clearly speaks of women prophesying in the congregations that he started. And Paul could hardly do otherwise because it's something characteristic throughout the Bible. We have Miriam, Deborah, Huldah. In fact, Deborah was a judge over all of Israel as well as a prophetess. We have Isaiah's wife in Isaiah chapter 8 and a number of other people. In the New Testament, we have Anna in Luke chapter 2. We have the four young daughters of Philip the Evangelist in Acts chapter 21. And we have the statement that where God pours out his spirit, he'll pour out his spirit on all flesh. His sons and daughters will prophesy that there won't be anything that can stop God's working, whether it's through male or female, because God gives gifts regardless of gender. We also see in verse 7 another gift, serving or ministering. The term that Paul uses here is one of his most common terms for his fellow ministers. It's a term that is used for Paul himself twice in this letter. It's a term that's used for Jesus in his ministry also later on in this letter. But a related term is used in Romans chapter 16 and verse 1 for Phoebe, a woman. So again, we see that this gift is not distributed according to gender. In verse 8, Whoever leads. Leadership in the early church was based on gifts and not based on hierarchy. We see some examples of leadership again in Romans chapter 16. Phoebe, Priscilla, who with Aquila led a house church, Junia and Andronicus, um, who are called notable apostles. Again, leadership is not a gift that's distributed based on gender. On May 27th, 1860, Catherine Booth gave her first sermon. Now, um, for those of you who may have heard that this emphasis on women's ministry started in the 60s, here is somebody from the 60s, uh, the very beginning of the 60s, but this was the 1860s. In Catherine Booth's first sermon, it started out this way. She, she felt so moved by the Holy Spirit. She felt so convicted. She felt like God wanted her to speak out, and she felt convicted by the Holy Spirit that she'd been disobeying, and she started moving toward the front. And her husband was shocked. Nothing like this had ever happened before. And so he stepped aside, and she said, I feel like God wants me to address the congregation. Nothing like that had ever happened before, but he trusted that his wife was sensitive to the Holy Spirit. He stepped out of the way. She spoke up and said, I have been disobeying the Holy Spirit. God has called me to speak his message. And, it, and as she began to speak, there were other women in the congregation where the Spirit began to move on them. And they began to weep as they felt God's Spirit touching them because they too had felt God calling them and had been resisting his calling. Well, William had never thought about these things before, but as he, as he beheld it, he realized this was God's Spirit working. And he wasn't going to resist God's Spirit came back to the podium and said, tonight we're going to have another service. Tonight my wife is preaching. And that was the beginning of their ministry together as a team that ultimately led to the founding of the Salvation Army. The salvation of millions of people around the world. A great revival came from obeying the Holy Spirit and the gifts that God had given. As members of Christ's body, we're all called to serve the Lord 
with the gifts that he's given us? Should only men yield themselves as living sacrifices? Should only men have renewed minds to strategize for God's work? Are the gifts of God's grace, God being the one who gives them to us, given by gender, or can God use any of us as God pleases to serve Christ's body? I want to close with a story because for many years I, I had been praying for a wife with compatible gifts. Uh, by that I didn't mean the same gifts. I, I certainly didn't want my wife to just be a, a professor. Professors are really boring. You know, I hate to tell you that. Uh, those of you who are professors here, please forgive me. But we, we, for the most part, we have fairly boring lives. So uh, I see some of the professors staring at me right now. Um, but you know it's true. Anyway. I was, I was praying for God to send me a wife. Uh, I was praying for a wife with compatible gifts. And I did meet a number of, of godly, fired-up women. But when I would pray about it, I didn't feel like this person was the person that the Lord wanted me to, to marry. So I, I was uh, single for a long time and uh, wondering what was wrong. And there was this one sister that I, I didn't think she could possibly be the one. Because uh, when we talked about it, she said she wasn't called to ministry. And I figured if somebody wasn't called to ministry, she couldn't put up with, with my calling because she wouldn't really understand the passion that was, that was driving me. Um, we had met, actually. She was an exchange student at Duke University from 1989 to 1990. She was doing research on American history for her PhD at the University of Paris. And... Uh, we were really good friends. She was the most fired up witness on campus. I, I'd, I'd go up to somebody to, to share Christ with them, and they would say, oh yeah, yeah, Medin, Medin Musunga, she, she, she told me the same thing a few days ago. So we kept in touch over the years. And in 1993 or 94, we even talked about marriage as we were corresponding. But I thought, no, it, it can't be the Lord's will because, uh, you know, I asked her, if she was called to ministry, and she said no. And we were both very disappointed. But what I didn't know was it was based on a semantic problem because we were defining ministry very differently. She was doing open-air evangelism on the streets while she was working on her dissertation. She was doing door-to-door -door evangelism in Muslim neighborhoods, trying to win people to Christ, working with drug addicts, she helped start a new church and was on the leadership team of the church. But when I said ministry, she thought I meant it had to be a pastor or a missionary, and so she said no. And so all these years, we were friends. You know, I was praying that God would send her a good husband. She was praying that God would send me a good wife. And then one day, I got a letter from her. She had gone back to her country, which was the Congo. She said, I don't know if I'm going to live or die because the troops are closing in on my city. And she had sent it out of the country by means of a relative who was leaving. By the time I got the letter, her town had already been burned to the ground. She and her sisters and mother and an aged relative pushed their father in a wheelbarrow out of the town as it was burning behind them. And then realized that they left behind his diabetes and blood pressure medicine. He was paralyzed from a stroke from diabetes and high blood pressure. And they had to flee into the forest. For 18 months, I didn't hear any word from her. And as I was praying, I was like, God, maybe I made a mistake. Maybe I should have, I mean, Medin was there the whole time. Maybe I should have, uh, maybe she was the right one. But God, you know, I acted in the integrity of my heart. I did what I, I felt was your will. And I felt what I thought was God's assurance, saying that he would do what was best for her and what was best for me. And a few days later, I, f I felt him again as I was praying, saying that it would be all right and that someday she and I would minister together. I didn't hear from her for 18 months. During those 18 months, Every member of the family was very sick at one time or another, very close to death at one time or another. Medin was often walking 10 miles a day to get food for the family. They were sick with malaria. She had to walk through snake-infested swamps. 
fields of army ants. Uh, they, were in, they didn't have medicine. They didn't have enough food. But at the end of those 18 months, I got a letter. I'm alive. I, Medin Musunga, am alive. And so we've been married now for three years and are discovering about how the gifts can work together. God gives us different gifts. God gives us different callings. But the most important thing is to find out what God wants us to do and to yield our lives wholly to his purposes. Nothing held back. Let's pray. Sovereign Lord, we depend on you. We depend on your spirit right now. Touch us, fall upon us. Speak to each of us, Lord, what you want us to do. And where we're doing things, just sometimes spinning our wheels, and it's not empowered enough by your spirit, or it's not exactly what you want us to do, please make us what you want us to be. Father, for those here who have not yet heard what your calling is. Each of us is a member of the body of Christ. Each of us has a mission from you. Each of us has a special and important purpose, not because we're so great, but Lord, because you are so gracious. And these are gifts, gifts of your grace, gifts that show us your love, by which you help us to express your love to one another. Lord, make us what you have called us to be. We ask you this. In the name of your Son, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ.